Okay, so let's start the afternoon session and the first speaker is Ernst about the non agreement thing. Okay, so, so uh, first of all, thanks. Uh, that's all this one to be here. Uh, and um, well, uh, the question was uh, to discuss aspects of longitudinal spin. And of course, that's something that has a very, very long history uh, uh, to it. Uh, so let me start at uh, maybe what I know to be sort of. The earliest one, I think there are a few uh, atomic <coughs> measurements actually that, that precede this, that already gave a hint of at least internal nucleon structure, but maybe not spin structure. But, so the first one, the uh, first evidence for the rich internal spin structure that I know of is in the end uh, measurement of the magnetic moment. Uh, so the expectation of a magnetic moment for um, a point like particle with spin one half is two. Um, at least in dimensional quantities, and in the case of the proton, it's actually about three times larger. So that's a big deal um, in the end. So, and uh, well, that's not something that you're going to um, get rid of with, let's say, any form of perturbative expansions with uh, small coupling constants. You just need to be thick at that point. So this, this factor of 5.8 or 6 is actually a big deal. It's such a big deal that magnetic moment is written on this robot. Okay, so if you didn't care about MRI and MR, then it's on this well. Mm -hmm. Um So, uh, look, I mean, it has many consequences, actually. One of them is that you can manipulate uh, proton spin independent of its motion, unlike in the case of uh, particles with uh, this G factor equal to 2. So it underlies much of what we in the end want to achieve that in the NC. Okay, so um, then the development um, of, let's say, this substructure at uh, higher energies, I think everybody knows about uh, Bjorken scaling, which maybe was a little bit fortuitous uh, in, uh, in the way it was seen, given that we've seen clear deviations from it. Uh, somewhat less known, uh, maybe uh, actually the relation of um, the two structure functions, or if you wish, the electromagnetic structure and the magnetic structure, uh, which in the end gave us the, the spin one half quarks at uh, high energy, uh, important parts um, going beyond this, this traditional Gelman uh, picture of a nucleon. So, uh, looking a little bit further, this is of course the nucleon as we all know and love it. Uh, I dominated that small values of X by uh, uh, numerous gluons. Um, uh, but taking uh, maybe a small step back, um, of course. Um, um, Previous curve and the lead up to uh, this is the development of the full um, particle model in the end. Um, and then um, well, this is a clear manifestation of uh, QCD radiation. Uh, so, now what is the thing? Gluons dominate, and we know remarkably little uh, about uh, the role they play in the spin. Um, so, well, uh, the two maybe unusual structure functions G1 is the helicity structure function, that's much of this talk. Uh, then there's also a leading twist um, transversity structure function. And now that gluons are um, actually polarized, as we'll see, uh, makes it much more interesting. And I think that's much of uh, the topic of Markov's talk uh, next. Um, and of course, well, the higher twist um, uh, structure functions as well. Let's not go there. Uh, so the interpretation is, is given, right? I mean, here you see this relation between these two. Um, so this, this electric equivalent and magnetic equivalent. Um, Divided by 2x uh, in the end, and then uh, the equivalent of such a structure in the case of helicity, where well, this is uh, the helicity difference as opposed to the sum over there. Um, okay, so uh, that's wonderful. You see it in textbooks nowadays, and actually it even gives you the, the factor of 5.6 or that. So uh, now, perhaps even more naive, uh, you could just write out the proton uh, wave function and then compute. Sort of the observed quantity a1, which is the structure function g1 over uh, f1, and you get a value of 5 over 8. Um, now, that's, um, you can compare that with experiment. Um, and this, uh, I find it funny, it's sort of like a stopped clock, right? I mean, once in a while it's correct. So, so if you look at uh, this, this structure function, uh, this, this asymmetry a1, measured as a function of x, and then compare it with this 5 over 8, which is about here. Actually, amusingly, at a value of about 0.3 or so, it even lines up. But um, this is very much like a stopped clock. I know of no reason why um, 
this would fundamentally be so. Uh, I guess, look, uh, well, uh, I mean, these measurements span the entire range, uh, so maybe you are right. Well, okay, it could, of course, also be negative. Um, so, anyway. Um, so, the point is, uh, you want to get rid of that, that um, non-perturbative um, x value um, in the end. Uh, and then relate it in a bit of a more fundamental way, and of course that goes over neutron decay. Uh, so for gamma five matrices in, um, in the operators, if you wish. Uh, and this is the the, the figure uh, well, you often see, and that in some sense started much of um, the field or restarted much of the field. So what I find also amusing in this, uh, right? I mean, so this is this Ellis Jaffa ensemble, the expectation, if you wish. Um, if you focus uh, on, let's say, an earlier generation of measurements, the ones here in the open points, and for the moment just um, ignore whatever is lower, um, it wouldn't be such a crazy expectation to just extrapolate it over there. Uh, so, in other words, um, well, X range actually matters, right? And certainly something at the level of measuring 90% of a range doesn't give you anything. Uh, in the end, you need to measure more. Uh, furthermore, uh, it's amusing that actually this data undershoots. In other words, uh, the entire surprise came about from a quantity that was small. How often have we heard, like, well, okay, this is small, let's not measure it, right? Um, okay, so the conclusion here was, of course, that uh, quark spins, quark and anti quark spins combined, con uh, contribute little to the proton spin, and strange quarks are strange, uh, negatively polarized. So, okay, so how does it come about? Uh, well, this integration of the structure function, at least in this leading order, you can write that out like this. Uh, that you can recast, of course, in two differences and the sum. Uh, now, if you pick uh, strange quarks equal to zero, uh, then all of a sudden you can relate it um, uh, to, um, uh, as in well, these two terms become the same. And given that these are differences, they relate to um, hyperlon decays. Uh, well, so you can look up which ones they are. This is neutron to proton. This is actually sigma to neutron. Uh, all of a sudden, you have a prediction. Um, now, as to the X range, of course, that goes with one over um, the center of mass energy. So, in other words, there's no substitute for center of mass energy, and that's a large part of the modulation for the MSE, of course. Um, okay, so uh, now you can turn this um, LSG offer some uh, around. Suppose you want to recover it uh, in the end. So. Uh, how do you do that? Um, well, one way would be to um, question whether this actually holds, whether the value is reliable, uh, so whether, um, well, indeed, this is an issue three symmetric system. Uh, you could do that. Uh, so you could just take partial derivatives, uh, quantify this, and what you end up with is a value of A8 to about 0.2 um, uh, that you would need. And that's a little bit outside of uh, what you find in literature in the end. Uh, so as to these measurements, um, uh, I looked this up um, following some discussion last week. Um, look, uh, much of this in, in this close and Roberts analysis is actually just coming directly from this uh, sigma to neutron decay as well as neutron to proton decay. And then uh, as to issue three, I don't think we have real experimental progress in this because these measurements are hard. Uh, but the measurement that has been made by the, the gate of collaboration is again one of F plus D in a heavier system, so it cascades to sigma. Um, at the same time, I mean, look, this is about 15 or 20 percent measurement. Um, so yeah, that's consistent with um, not such sizable shifts. Uh, on the other hand, I think nobody uh, at this point um, would have truly reliable insight as to um, how much such a shift would actually be. So there, there's vast parameter space to, uh, to explore. Uh, and well, here I just looked up a couple of um, old and maybe somewhat newer um, uh, values. Uh, in the end. Okay, so uh, this started uh, restarted interest in nucleon spin. Um, well, it has become a worldwide quest, as we'll see. Uh, there are many follow up questions you can ask. Of course, one of them was about gluons and gluons being polarized in the sense that, well, such a diagram of formally higher order uh, could actually numerically matter. Um, if you want to pursue that game in a similar way to this issue three game, you need a, a polarization value for these gluons that is actually larger than the quantum spin itself. And that then in turn means if you want to maintain this, this value of one half h bar, that you get very high uh, orbital momenta as well. So that's, that makes for a very interesting uh, internal structure, I'd say. 
Of course, you can uh, ask other questions. You can ask, well, is the experiment right? Uh, unmeasured regions, you name it. Many uh, questions you, uh, you can ask. Um, okay, so um, in this quest, actually now, and I think that's, that's quite superb, we truly have what I think is, um, let's call it two experimental techniques or methods. Uh, one, uh, polarized lepton nucleon scattering, and the other one, uh, polarized proton proton scattering. But actually both contribute in uh, sensitive ways, and in ways so that you can compare um, and convince yourself that um, you're really stepping beyond, let's say, having a curiosity in one particular system. So um, between the two, uh, they, they have at this point predictive power, and we've seen confirmations, uh, and, and both actually there are really complementary insights uh, coming out of both at this point, uh, and sensitive uh, insights. Um, so it's not longer confined to a single system at this point, which uh, I think helps. Now, as to this worldwide quest, I think uh, experiments, of course, um, given that, that they started some, some 30 years ago or so, uh, there are experiments that are past, there are experiments that are present. So this show, sort of shows the developed map of um, spin experiments with sensitivity to the topics here. Um, still currently ongoing, uh, Compass at CERN and uh, STAR at RIC. And, um, We'll see that later in the bias of the that show. Um, but that's not to um, talk negatively in any way or form about past experiments, of course. Um, um, okay, so first, deep inelastic scattering. Uh, maybe back to this sum for a second. First, check actually that uh, experimentally was performed. There was a question about, uh, well, okay, this relation to the simplest of high power decays of the Jurgen sum. Um, so experimentally, what you do is you swap out a proton for a neutron. That sounds simpler than it is um, in practice. Uh, so initially that was done with heavy targets, later with EDM3. Looking ahead to an EIC, it's probably over neutrons and EDM3 as well. And maybe that's more. It could be an end. Um, okay, so the very first data there actually came out of the SMC collaboration. You see it over here. Um, so what this shows is the build-up of uh, the deuteron structure function, similar to the CMC figure, and again over the range, which is well, now about 99% of the uh, range in, available range in X, uh, and then the uncertainties you see can become rather large. So, well, you have at that point the deuteron, you could obtain from that a neutron by subtraction with rather naive um, ways of dealing with um, nuclear effects, maybe looking ahead to, towards the EIC, we should become better about this. Uh, and then obtain the first uh, Bjorken sum, which is 0.2 with an uncertainty which is about a quarter or so in size. Uh, well, super, 25%. Uh, now, um, maybe more modern data. Uh, this is from 2010. Uh, the accumulation of compass data, you actually really see that the precision has gone up tremendously in, uh, in that data. Quite impressive data set has actually reached the, the level now where the um, Experimental uncertainties are about as large as uh, the leading order QCD correction on the pure concern. Uh, so by now it's maybe not longer purely about, um, uh, let's say, this, this overall organization, but also in the running in some sense. Um, and then um, the modern, um, as in the latest compass value, it's actually quite recent paper, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, indeed, you have this. Um, uh, well, uh, first moment over here, and then uh, GA over GV which is a measurement that, well, by any measure is, is better than 10% uh, at this point from a single experiment. So the collective uh, measurements, uh, all measurements are actually better than this. So, so okay, check, done. Uh, time to move on. Um, well, we can ask a bit more about this delta sigma, written down as A0. From the same publication, uh, you end up with this well-known value of about 30%. Again, from a single experiment, consistent with um, global analysis uh, in the end. Okay, so, um, well, the experiment clearly was right in the beginning. You can ask now questions about scaling violations. And the start of, uh, let's say, analyses of scaling violations is more or less um, also 20 years ago uh, by now. So what you see here is uh, early Slack experiments, even 43, brought on together with SMC data. So what is the difference between these two experiments? Well, okay, one is an electron beam, the other one is a proton beam. Uh, the um, energies between them are about a factor of six different. 
This is that Q squared values are a uh, factor difference, and indeed you can directly see from the data that there are scaling violations. So it's often overlooked uh, in the end. So, okay, that leads uh, to uh, various expectations. There's an asymptotic solution for it uh, in the end, uh, but of course that has not been observed uh, directly from the data uh, in any way or form at this, uh, this time. So this was the start of Coralize PQCG analysis. There are much more modern works at this point. And I think the two forefront ones uh, at this time were the NMPDF group and the BSSV group uh, in the end. So NMPDF, um, they started initially um, by analyzing only polarized inclusive deep and elastic scattering data. The DSSV group has been, um, uh, let's say, quicker to implement data that go beyond. Uh, so they were certainly first uh, to incorporate RIC data. Uh, they are also first to incorporate semi-inclusive uh, deep and elastic scattering data, at least in combination with RIC data. So typically, if you compare these two groups, uh, then and then PDF, you could argue that well, they are probably a little bit more flexible in the sense of how they deal with functional forms and such. Uh, in the case of DSSV, they are typically uh, more at the forefront of including the data uh, sets, and in some sense, they are more complete in uh, their description of data. Uh, that's an important point. Come, we'll come back. Um, of course, um, well, the follow up works, uh, and PDF now does include the link data. That matters too. Uh, so, um, well, Flavor of structure, uh, right? That's, that's where we were. Uh, so at this point, uh, there's a wealth of data. You see here a compilation of an early DSSV analysis. So they were first to include also semi inclusive deep and elastic scattering data. And well, uh, what you see here is um, yeah, in the eye of the beholder, right? I mean, um, look, on the one hand, it's um, the post stamp collection, if you wish. On the other hand, it's, of course, uh, a treasure trove of information. In the so what do you see? Uh, well, uh, SMC, uh, semi-inclusive measurements of unidentified charged hadrons. Um, Hermas, uh, likewise, in the end, of course, compass data as well. Uh, and well, in particular, the Hermas uh, collaboration at the time had the superb particle identification. Uh, so they were first, actually, to have identified KOM data. Compass by now has, um, has those two. Um, now, of course, uh, between uh, these experiments, uh, the center of mass energy of the Hermes experiment is lower uh, than that of the COMPAS and SMC experiments, and with that, the X range of this data actually is also somewhat uh, smaller. Okay, so this lives again in this region of, say, 10 to minus 2, a few times 10 to minus 2. Um, okay, so this is, um, well, indeed, in some sense, a post-time collection. On, uh, on the other hand, so you would like to do some reduction on this. Uh, and, well, indeed, these global analysis come in, and what you see is um, that, indeed, uh, and that's, as if you wish, um, call it a technicality, but a quite important one, that this actually does depend, in particular, in this uh, K-on segment of... Um, this collection uh, on uh, the choice or the use of fragmentation functions. So with that, um, uh, you see more and more that fragmentation function fits and polarized fits or unpolarized fits go hand in hand. And that's actually quite an important one also going forward. So, so okay, what do we learn from this? Well, now let's compare um, one of these earlier DSSV fits uh, with uh, this early NMPDF work, uh, and this is what you see as a function of x. So, um, well, okay, um, uncertainties are large, that's for sure as such. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of tension between uh, well, what you could characterize as inclusive data and semi-inclusive data. So working that out a little bit further, uh, since I think it's actually interesting, uh, is like, look, um, I mean, here you have this, this figure reproduced, uh, between these two analyses, F and D constraints feed into DSSV analysis more so than in the NNPDF analysis. So this assumption of SU3 symmetry comes in a little bit more. Uh, in the case of uh, this DSSV analysis, you have in this range actually this Hermann scale data that comes in. Um, okay, uh, now um, you may then say, well, hmm, okay, maybe there's internal tension. Yeah, not so. Uh, interestingly, uh, so what you see here is a breakdown of um, chi-square contributions um, over a somewhat wider range. 
And then uh, what you in the end see is that uh, in terms of this strangeness contribution, the dominant impact is indeed made by the KO data that sets the overall parabola. Uh, deep inelastic scattering data is, uh, is a constraint as well here in red, but it's considerably, uh, or has a considerably wider parabola. Um, central values seem to line up, uh, so, so you don't have evidence from that uh, by itself. Um, and then other data sets have well, essentially no impact. Right? I think they're flat lines. Uh, uh, so the last word has not been spoken uh, on this, I believe. Um, Looking ahead, of course, that implies a very clear role for MDNC. They will resolve this simultaneously with, uh, well, hopefully, in uh, fully simultaneous fits of KL data, inclusive data, and you are able to recover much more region in X uh, so that you can get rid of some of these constraints that may or may not be artificial. Um, okay, so uh, this was slightly um, older work, if you wish, so it's certainly worthwhile. Uh, to look at somewhat more recent data and alternative approaches to uh, the question of strangeness. What you see here is a somewhat more recent um, work by the Compass collaboration. Uh, it's leading order and it's a direct extraction uh, of, of strangeness and anti-strangeness. So you see the results over here. Uh, no evidence for a difference between the two, also no evidence for um, well, a sizable uh, positive sum in the end. So, um, now, this is not the only thing, of course, that Compass has done. Alternative um, uh, work exists as well. Um, look, the main message is that this certainly is still a very, very open question. Uh, that the EIC is probably uh, essential to get to a real answer. I think there are very, very few alternatives um, to this. Um, uh, so, to uh, pick up another um, aspect of um, uh, a similar uh, compass analysis, it's the same work actually. Uh, you see here is uh, the difference between uh, anti-up and anti-down part polarization as a function of x, uh, again, uh, with a number of models um, uh, that in parts were inspired, we would say, by um, the flavor asymmetry that has been seen in the unpolarized C, right? So the 866 and the 48 um, uh, work, uh, earlier work, and well, Seacrest also coming on by this point. Um, so uh, the outcome uh, of this is, uh, well, indeed delta u bar minus delta d bar, slightly positive, sure, uh, but it's um, not significantly so, so it's a one and a half standard deviation effect or so. This is actually an area where um, existing experiments are making an impact, and I'll show something about that later from Vic. Uh, strangeness now is, is very, very hard. So, um, okay, so uh, the other part is about small x, and somehow uh, this figure is um, always burned in my brain uh, about small x. Um, uh, as in, um, in the early days, uh, any extrapolation of G1 was either a constant or some regular type form, x to a power alpha, and it actually took, I think, the first precision neutron data to wake up the community that that was maybe not um, the only thing you could do. Uh, so I find it just stunning that if you look at the E154 precision in the back points, that if you see a dependence like this, well, sure, you can extrapolate that as a constant, uh, but it's certainly not the only possibility in the end. Um, and if you then, with vast uncertainties at the time, look at data that extend a little bit further, I mean, these uncertainties are vast because it was a neuron beam, but also because a neutron is determined. In, um, if you do that from a neutron and a proton, it's a difference measurement, uh, unlike an equal three measurement. Uh, uncertainties are truly large, and actually, if you look at this uh, this power fit, which is uh, one over uh, x to uh, 0.9, that surely does seem like a better description. Uh, now, today, uh, Compass has indeed improved uh, the uncertainty by a factor compared to um, SMC. So in this range, we do have more insight. And nevertheless, um, this is truly a very, very far uh, way still towards, let's say, X dependence as expected in an asymptotic limit from d -clop, or looking at different X dependencies that you can get from the evolution of that's beyond d so, uh, Again, here I think the EIC could do quite a bit. Um, 
that's illustrated over here, so what you see on the right hand side is just well, the repetition of the same figure. So neutron figure on the right hand side is a proton figure uh, for ESC with pseudo data. What you see in these dashed curves is actually the freedom allowed um, by current uh, modern particle distributions, and then the pseudo data, how far you would extend for different values of uh, the energy dependence. This comes from this basic um, assessing um, energy dependence of key measurements article most of us may know. So if you look at this, uh, I mean, of course, it is true that you could end up in a situation where you again have a situation like this, but the axis is completely different, namely, you live by 10 minus 4, so two orders of magnitude law. That's conceivable, but then you also need to ask, like, well, what is the impact actually of that region uh, for the spin uh, as a whole? We'll get to that um, a little bit later. Uh, it's very clear that, um, well, you will qualitatively and quantitatively completely overhaul this truly unsatisfactory situation for at least two orders of magnitude in X. That's nothing which needs that, I would argue. Um, okay, so switching gear a little bit to proton-proton uh, scattering, which may not be on everybody's daily uh, mind, uh, so let me go a little bit slower. In some respects, uh, expand a little bit. Uh, so this makes use of um, the first polarized proton collider, uh, which is polarized beams at high energy, uh, which is actually an important step towards EIC as well. Uh, it's half of the problem, if you wish. Uh, so, well, we've seen this two main experiments, Star and Phoenix, of course, with an injector complex, and both of these experiments you can manipulate spin in um, many ways, uh, as you heard from Elke yesterday, uh, that happens with good systematics, etc. Uh, now, in terms of data sets, um, uh, that always confuses many. Uh, we name those by um, year uh, in which that data was taken. And then as a compilation of um, data that was taken, uh, the dominant data sets uh, are longitudinal and transverse, obviously. They are more or less balanced in terms of their integrated luminosity. Luminosities acquired at 500 GeV are about a factor of 4 or 5 larger than a 200 GeV. Um, you see the build-up over here. Uh, so looking at, at delta G, right? So looking at, uh, if you wish, the equivalent of scaling violations in deep inelastic scattering where you have limited sensitivity. Uh, at RIC, uh, measurements you would make, or the equivalent of an A1, if you wish, would be an ALL. Um, that is a convolution of uh, the probe with um, the object of interest, of course, except that the probe itself is the object of interest. So you get well, two. Uh, delta F or elicity distribution divided by um, uh, elicity average uh, with, of course, hard scattering uh, elements in between and possibly fragmentation functions uh, in there. Also, these hard scattering elements are calculable. Uh, you can tune your experiment such, for example, of probability so that they are sizable. In terms of process contributions, it's a sum. Uh, so, in the RIC range, typically uh, it is dominated by either gluon gluon scattering very small values of Pt, say up to about HEV or so before fragmentation, uh, and then by quark gluon scattering that takes alpha from um, so quark, quark and quark anti quark scattering are typically smaller contributions in the end. Uh, so that's a further complication if you wish for Pt scattering. And the last uh, complication in a way is that for each value of your transverse momentum of let's say a jet, uh, you actually probe a sizable fraction of um, Jurgen X, uh, in this case, Pro X. So it's illustrated over here. Uh, now, importantly, um, while in DIS, uh, most spin measurements, we actually assume that cross sections um, are well described, and we sort of often do that by our bias of um, F2 measurements. Um, you would want to see that in many measurements. Um, in the case of STAR, uh, here you have the jet cross-sections, alternative um, cross-sections like pyron cross-sections, proton cross-sections, and you see later W cross-sections are all described. Looking ahead, I certainly hope also that um, in many cases uh, we will see direct cross-section measurements also at lower energy uh, out of deep and elastic scattering. I think it is time that we uh, move ourselves a little bit out of the yeah, DIS and therefore we know the cross-sections. Uh, we may know the cross sections in the end, but it doesn't mean that we uh, always know 
there is adequately described and uh, and there are some to be learned it settled quite a few discussions I believe. Um, um, okay, so uh, now looking at these asymmetries ALL, so what you see here is actually the, I would say the first impact uh, data set from WIC, uh, 2009 data from STAR, uh, jets, inclusive jet measurements in two pseudo rapidity ranges that are then analyzed in both this DSSV uh, analysis as well as the NMPDF analysis. So that's an update to the initial NMPDF um, work I showed. It now incorporates the WIC data. So what do you see? Well, in both cases, actually, uh, the spot of the X times delta G over a limited range is positive. The integral um, agrees. Uh, it's about 0.2 units of H bar. With an uncertainty that is about uh, half to a third. It's positive. Um, so a different way of visualizing that is, uh, is like so. So what you see here is uh, the lower range of the um, Rig sensitivity 0.05 and then integrated up to 1 uh, that goes beyond the rig kinematic range, but it's a well constrained range. So, if you wish, the extrapolation here at least an extrapolation that is bound. Uh, and on the uh, vertical axis, you see a range that is 10 to the minus 3, somewhat arbitrarily, to 0.05. Um, so, what you get are these, these contours, um, and you could compare. Uh, the world before these star measurements and the world after. So before in green, uh, after in, uh, in blue. And the two uh, messages you get out of this is, well, okay, indeed, the data is impactful. Uh, the other thing is that it's quite easy still to hide about a unit of H bar, so twice the bottom spin, in a non-measured region. That's again one where you either need to measure in a very different way, or you have a whole thing that's significant. Um, so how do you go about improving this? Uh, well, the obvious one, you need to get to smaller x values. So 10 minus 2 is not adequate in any way or form. Uh, at RIC, the way to do that is to go to higher energies, so 500 GeV. That's a slow way of making uh, a living, given that this goes around square root of s, so it's factor 2. Uh, you could instrument that more forward regions, and that's, um, that was in parts covered by uh, Elker yesterday, I believe it was. So, um, in uh, terms of um, this range, uh, of course you can gain further precision. Uh, you do that by continued measurement. Uh, you would certainly, if you see that your extrapolations are this vast, aim to get insight in an x-dependence here. Uh, you do that by correlation measurements uh, in the end. Uh, and those go over complementary problems like digests. Uh, now, Rick continues to make progress on both of these. Uh, Oker covered a fair part of this also yesterday. Uh, but at the same time, it's clear that um, you will need an ESC, certainly if you want to go for X values below 10 minus 3 in any sensitive uh, way or form. Um, okay, so a glimpse at uh, a data that is now coming out of Rick. So here you see uh, measurements of very, very forward pseudo rapidities. At the top energy of 500 GeV, they're neutral ion measurements, even more forward values. You see here compared the uncertainty bands that you would predict or expect them, and the experimental sensitivities. So, so, given the number of points, this should be impactful once you go into its weighting. Point by point, <coughs> and these measurements, of course, appear to have similar sensitivity to uh, current expectations. So, so uh, progress is to be expected, but don't expect a transformation. Um, the future of this is correlation measurements. Inclusive measurements typically have this platonic asymmetry that is small. Uh, so the way to increase that is by having both jets in the forward region. Uh, now, as to kinematic sensitivity, first digest measurements, um, digest asymmetry measurements, uh, have been published as well, rather recently, you see it over here. Um, it's again 200 GeV, and it's done for two topologies of the jets. So in one case, the pseudo rapidities are more or less the same, and in the other case, uh, the signs are opposite. Okay, so think about jets that go like this versus jets that go like that. And kinematically, they're pretty really different. Um, well, uh, of course, we extend this also to 500 GeV. The uh, situation is, again, rather similar in the sense that the points uh, individually are similar uh, in, in the uncertainties on the point are similar to um, uh, the PDF evaluations we currently have. Given the collection of points, you again expect uh, earlier impacts, but not a transformation. Um, this has been extended further, and 
in terms of topologies, you see that over here, also with instrumentation that goes in a more forward direction. It's not as forward as this three to four, uh, it's rather one to two, of existing end cap, where we do have tracking. So in terms of simulated extra balance, you see that illustrated over here, right? So this is what I showed earlier as well, that these ranges are rather wide, but with these different topologies, you start to separate the different uh, particles that take, uh, take part in this collision. And you see here the asymmetries, um, and this is an interesting one actually uh, in my mind. <coughs> Okay, and looking forward to um, uh, quark polarizations at top energy. Uh, this is a tour de force experimentally. But at 500 GeV, we are above the W and Z production cost uh, thresholds. Uh, in polarized collisions, those offer unique opportunities actually to get at quark and anti quark polarizations by flavor. You see that worked out here. There are extreme limits in X, but also in pseudo rapidity, where you have direct sensitivity, of course, at Born level, uh, to ratios of quark uh, helicity over uh, the quark average um, helicities, so difference over the average. In the case of the quarks, uh, up quarks, in the case of the anti up quarks, down, anti down uh, as well, uh, by charge separation. So here you see the cross sections uh, compared. Um, so for W plus, W minus, um, and as well as the C, compared to measurements that made at the NHC as well as at the Tevatron. Some of those are proton anti proton So it's again one of those where um, measurements actually go across systems, which I think is important. Whether you want to call that universality or not, whichever. Um, it's a curiosity also that actually the sensitivity of um, the rate measurements uh, for cross sections start to reach a level where actually ratios of cross-sections, where of course normalizations and such cancel, uh, are starting to be complementary to um, constraints set by uh, EF66 um, and others. Uh, so that by itself is an interesting measurement at this stage. Uh, it's not a problem as well. So let me move on. Uh, what you see here are the um, single spin asymmetries AL versus pseudo-rapidity, uh, lepton pseudo-rapidity, uh, and then compared again with um, prior knowledge uh, from um, uh, part of distributions. Um, so what you see here is that the points actually individually have reached a precision that is significantly better uh, than what the bands suggest. So the impact is completely obvious and you see that quantified here. So what you see here is uh, X times delta U bar minus delta D bar, same contribution as um, same distribution as you saw earlier from Compass, prior knowledge over here. And then with uh, the new data from Rick, at this point, I would say there's uh, more than evidence uh, for actually a flavor of symmetry in, in uh, the line C, polarized line C. Okay. It's actually impactful. Of course, it's also true that if you look at these larger asymmetry values, in absolute sense, larger, that's where you are sensitive to quark and anti quark. Uh, quark up quark and down quark um, helicity distributions, and those agree very well. In other words, this is again one of those manifestations that this entire framework hangs together. It hangs together well. Now, looking ahead to an EIC, uh, what you see here is uh, a compilation of uh, measurements that have an impact on delta G. So I truncated it at the upper end, where of course you now have the star W and Z measurements. You see our points from fixed targets and then direct measurements that extend well of the same values in X, but of course reach hard, uh, harder scales in that case. Compare that with coverage you would get out of an EIC, and you see that there's two orders of magnitude difference, uh, both in X and Q squares. Um, of course, that should transform our insights uh, in the end. Um, so you could look at uh, G1, and for the first time over a very wide range, you would become sensitive directly as in you could take a direct derivative, if you wish, um, to um, well, scaling violations and with that delta G. I think this would be one of the most convincing, directly convincing ways of demonstrating this. So, uh, you could analyze this, and it will certainly be analyzed. Uh, you will have a host of um, complementary processes available to you as well. Hopefully those will enter in simultaneous fits. Uh, that's not what is done currently for projections. Uh, but nevertheless, even without these complementary channels, you see a very significant impact 
purely, of course, originating from this vast extent in the uh, kinematic range. So let's quantify it here uh, over a range from 10 minus 3 to 1 in terms of quark, sum of quark and anti quark helicities. Uh, so if you wish, uh, the quark and anti quark contribution to the problem spin, and on the vertical axis delta g. So current knowledge, which is current as of five years ago or so. Uh, and then involvement with different configurations of EMC. You see complementary or comparable uncertainties at this point in terms of delta G and delta sigma, and you might attempt to do a subtraction measurement. Uh, of course, uh, this has also been updated. Uh, this is the reference. Um, in terms of uh, global helicities, uh, we saw that Rick continues to make a significant impact on this. What has been done is to include expectations for data quantify the sensitivities, and what you see in the end is that, well, okay, the RIG program will make a vast contribution, uh, but it will not answer anything about the full moment. For that, actually, you do need an EIC, and furthermore, you need another high energy to really get that. So, let me wrap up here. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're still very, very far from fundamental knowledge, let alone understanding of the beyond spin. The PIS data, of course, restarted our field with actually almost a single measurement, but that by now is quite old. Um, came about from small x, it came about from a quantity that was small. At times it seems that we overlooked that. There's great value in uh, measuring small quantities. Uh, so, um, data on the problem have by now been complemented, of course, with um, targets containing neutrons. That is not necessarily the same as a neutron target, of course. We know that the Gerd ensemble is correct, but not just in terms of its normalization, but even in one order of running at lowish scales. I think is an achievement. Uh, overall, we have reasonable insight in um, quark and anti quark spins, but we know very little still about strange quarks. We have some sensitivities to scale, but that's great. Um, there's a bright future there as well. Uh, and so uh, what, what I think is quite exciting is that we are also maturing um, in spin measurements well beyond purely collinear distributions. So, I mean, in the end, if you want to get to the level of uh, not just knowledge but understanding, that is maybe the next logical pathway to take, no matter what, uh, what direction you prefer. Uh, I don't want to go there. I like them both. In the end. Now, as to Rick, uh, I think we've first um, indications that gluons from direct measurements that gluons are positively polarized in the problem, but their contribution can be large. Uh, from that, it should be very, very clear also that subtractions make no sense. So, if you want to argue that we need transverse polarization because once you do more polarization, it gives you small effects, please stop doing that. We have no scientific basis for it. Um, with uh, the W uh, measurements, uh, we uh, have by now, I would say, conclusive proof the existence of a favor symmetry also in the polarized light C. Uh, and there is also a complementary start to the DIS measurements on these DMD measurements, uh, which makes for a quite bright future, I believe. For the Lattice QCD is outside of my area of expertise. Nevertheless, I learned quite a bit last week. Uh, I am very impressed with the progress that is being made on um, X-dependent particle distributions. Uh, nevertheless, I would be uh, super reluctant to stick that into any form of uh, fit at this time. Um, that seems um, a few bridges too far at the moment, uh, but who knows, right? I mean, um, looking five years back, we had nothing. Looking five years ahead, well, it's easier to predict the past. Um, Looking at PIC in theory will of course be essential to solving the spin puzzle in the sense of being to understand the spin. Thank you. So, uh, your explanation of uh, these differences between the fraction of the S uh, 